Okay. So one of the things that I think um, is kind of one of the more challenging questions is when they kind of um, connect different topics that don't necessarily um, aren't obviously related to each other, like um, kinetics and um, equilibrium. And so the example here is industrial versus theoretical conditions. And you used to have to know the, the industrial conditions for the IB, but that's no longer a requirement. But that doesn't mean the IB couldn't tell you those conditions and expi expect you to explain those. And so the most common one is the Haber process, which is the synthesis of ammonia using um, this information. And so if you're looking at the optimal theoretical conditions based on this equilibrium problem and this delta H value, okay, What type of pressure and what type of temperature would maximize your yield of NH3 in this situation? Lily. Low okay, why low temperature? Okay, an exothermic reaction means the delta H is located where in the reaction? Where would you place the delta H in the reaction? On the product side. As a positive, right? You always add it to the side but you only put the negative sign when you take it out of the reaction to give it context. Those signs, the negative signs are always about context, like outside of the reaction. When it's in the reaction, it's always plus one side or the other. So a low temperature means you decrease heat, which causes a shift in that direction. And so therefore you'd want a low temperature to um, create more NH3, okay? What kind of pressure would you want to maximize the amount of ammonia here? Moritz. Why? Because you want more, because the left side has more molecules. Okay. So how does low pressure help you? Um, because it's low pressure, then it's going to help. Okay. Uh, you had the right concept, but the the kind of wrong application. Um, Alejandra. Okay. Yeah, with pressure, as you increase pressure, you want to shift to the side with less gas molecules, because there's less space. And so there's more collisions and you're going to want to minimize the number of gas molecules that are present in equilibrium. So you want a high pressure here. Okay. So that itself is a question the IB could ask. Like it might be like, here's the Hopper process. Um, question A, state um, the, 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 the state the change of the position of equilibrium when pressure is increased. And then part B, state the, um, the um, position of equilibrium change um, when temperature is increased. And then part C would be, well, in industry, you'll see that they run it at, oh, well, I guess it's 200 atmospheres or like, I guess, um, I guess that's what 100 so it's like 20,000 kPa about and then um, 450 degrees Celsius okay. okay so comment on the industrial optimal conditions okay what's one comment about those values there Okay, um, Alejandro. Okay, temperature is much higher than optimal, right? Because the pressure makes sense because you want to make more um, NH3. Okay. Um, Lil, do you have, so temperature is pretty high. What's the reasoning for why you'd want a high temperature in this reaction, even though it produces less yield? Moritz. Oh. Yeah, okay, so what this does is it increases reaction rate. Okay, and the loss in yield is outweighed by how fast you make it. So this is the connection between equilibrium and kinetics that SL or HL students would have to kind of think about because there are always two things you have to consider in industry, the yield and how fast you make it because you'd rather make a 60% yield in an hour than a 95% yield in six hours. There's just 
there's weighing of conditions here. Okay. So the temperature increases the reaction rate to outweigh the decrease in yield. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to phrase this question correct next. Okay. What does that information tell you about the activation energy of this reaction? Moritz. It's really high. It's really high. Okay. It has a very high activation energy. Because it must be so high that if you run it at low temperature with the yield, it must slow it down so much that it's not worth it. Okay. It must slow it down so much that it is not worth it. And so that's the kind of question that the IB might ask. They'll be like, state and explain why in industry would um, execute or do this um, process at 200 atmospheres and 450 degrees Celsius. And you would say, well, the pressure aligns with an increase in yield because a higher pressure causes a shift to the products in this scenario because it has less gas moles. But the temperature is actually creating a lesser yield. So the only reason why you would do that is to speed up the reaction um, faster than the loss of yield. And then that would also relate to higher um, activation energy because the reaction must be really slow at low temperatures. Okay. Questions? And again, the IB can find a lot of different ways to connect this as well. Maybe um, they don't tell you the delta H and then you have to um, calculate the delta H using bond enthalpies. Or maybe they um, tell you all this, but then have you identify the Lewis dot structure of NH3 and then identify the molecular geometry of NH3 and the bond angles and things like that. So. Um, a lot of different ways to connect an equilibrium question like this to other topics. And that's really the challenge of seeing those connections and understanding that you have to think outside the box sometimes for those kind of exceptional questions. Questions about any explanation here or anything that we talked about here? Okay. Energy cycles, actually, I'll, I'll keep this HL, but I don't think this is necessarily out of the realm of possibility of SL, even though it's not explicitly stated. I think it's still possible that they could ask you something about this in HL as kind of a challenge question and not like a normal question. So an energy cycle is a visualization of, a pro of uh, um, various reactions that add up to an overall reaction, okay? And I don't know if, I don't remember when I talked about this in the review, but I think the visualization of it actually helps you solve things a little bit easier. And so one example of energy cycle is the enthalpy of solution. Wait, is this only for HL? Uh, I think specifically the reaction itself is HL, Hannah, but I would say just be prepared to maybe see an energy cycle on the SL test and just know what to do. Okay, so you may not know, you may not have this exact um, energy cycle, but if they diagram one like this, you should be able to know what you're doing. Okay. Sorry, this is a solid. So this is an example of an energy cycle. An energy cycle is a, like I said, a visualization of multiple steps of a reaction to try to um, calculate an overall reaction because it's kind of like Hess's law. It's another way of diagramming Hess's law, to be honest with you. And it's very visual though, and you can kind of see things. And because enthalpy is what's called a state function.
meaning that the pathway doesn't matter. The resulting value should always be the same no matter what pathway you take as long as you end up at the, the same conclusion, the same products and the same reactants. So when I'm doing energy cycles, especially for HL, and let's say I wanted... Let's see. This value right here in this energy cycle. I'm going from MgOS to Mg2 plus plus O2 minus. The way I do it is I draw an arrow from the reactants to the products in the in the alternative pathway. So what I say is, well, that purple arrow is one way, but this is the other way. Y'all see how y'all see what I did there? Okay. And what's nice about that is if I draw it that way, then all I have to do is make the arrows match that arrow and it'll always work. So it's a visual way to think of energy cycles to make things easier on yourself, especially in multiple choice. We're not actually having to calculate. They'll put an energy cycle on a multiple choice and say, what's the overall value, right? I just say, draw the arrow and make all the arrows match, which tells you that this arrow is okay. This needs to be negative. This needs to be negative so that it adds up to the lattice enthalpy here. So I find that drawing the arrow on the visual energy cycles from wherever you're starting to wherever you're finishing, even in Born-Haber cycles, maybe on a Born-Haber cycle, they ask you to calculate electron affinity. Well, just draw the arrow the other direction and then just make sure all the arrows add up. So let me see, I think I might have one really quickly and then we'll go back to, uh, let's see. Yes. So that's solution. Hydration is gaseous to aqueous. Uh, ohm. Oh yeah. So the idea is that this is my reactants and these are my products, right? So this arrow, this purple arrow, this arrow right here is one pathway to get there. The other pathway is this. So just make all your arrows match that big arrow and just add them all together and it'll work every time. Yeah. Is it kind of unrelated to my room? Um, when you're going from like elements to lattice, mm -hmm. is that just um, atomization for both? Then um, ionization and electron affinity and then those things added together? Okay. Let's look at that because that's a good question. And I want you to be able to kind of visualize that um, in a slightly different manner. That's what I was about to show you because I'm going to show you a, uh, a Born-Haber cycle and then kind of show you how you want to use the energy cycle to do that as well. Oh, I guess I don't have one here. Let me find one really quickly. Because, yeah, I don't want you to, like, I think it's easiest. Let's see. Uh, that was not very... Okay, so here's how I want you to think about it, okay? So, oh, actually, I don't like this. because They don't have the arrows in the correct, in the direction that is actually represented. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Let's see. I want to see one where it's like showing the actual like direction of um, the last that they'll be going upward and stuff like that, because I think I think that's where a lot of students struggle because they don't understand which way lattice enthalpy is. Let me see. Ah, here it is. That's, I think this one's better. Oh, sweet. I hope the resolution is not too bad. Okay. This is an example of a born hypercycle. Okay, so this is all the different steps. And I don't think the IB is going to have you draw one. They'll usually have one diagrammed for you already to simplify the process. So let's say you want enthalpy of formation, which is elements to, um, to solid. You can go from here to here, or you can go like that. And what that tells you is that 
every sign is pointing the right way except my lattice enthalpy. Because lattice enthalpy is going from solid to gaseous ions, so it's always in the wrong direction on a born harbor cycle, like if it's drawn correctly. Okay? And so, yeah, it's adding everything up, and then you have to subtract the lattice enthalpy because the arrow is pointing up, which is the correct way to do it. Yes, Alex? If the arrow is pointing down, it should be a negative number, correct? Because, but that's not actually the definition of lattice enthalpy, so you have to be careful. So, like, yeah, if the arrow is pointing down and you make that X and you're trying to solve for it, um, actually, no, like, look, let's, let's do this, okay? Let's ignore the arrow, like, even the direction of the arrow, and say, I want lattice enthalpy. Lattice enthalpy is this right so the other way to get there is this so it would be delta hf negative delta hf plus all these values to get there and that would be the correct direction for the sign and everything like that but you're right a lattice enthalpy value should be positive if you're going from ga solid to gaseous ions it should be negative in a born haber cycle but I don't want you to, like, I'm trying to minimize what you have to memorize here. Cause like, I know like some teachers will say, just remember that it's atomization plus um, ionization plus um, bond enthalpy plus um, electron affinity minus last enthalpy equals enthalpy of formation. And you're like, there's no way I'm gonna remember that. Like there's 21 topics that I'm gonna have to remember. You want me to remember one sign that's different in six different variables? No, have the born hopper cycle, draw your arrow and that will reduce one thing that you have to worry about, stress about memorizing, because this arrow always works. As long as you know what last enthalpy is, just draw the arrow and all the arrows, you just need to make a match. Okay. Yeah. Last enthalpy, the definition is endo. Because the definition of last enthalpy is the energy required to convert a solid ionic crystal lattice into gaseous ions. That would be exo? No, be endo. Because oh, you have to break the ionic yeah, bonds. Yeah. yeah. So what's the negative? The one the negative value? Oh, um, okay. Okay. Um, no, that one actually is correct. That's a good question, Erica. It's kind of like this. I should have done that. Sorry. I didn't see that extra stuff there. So you do need to follow the species there. So there is a, a dip there. So that would be correct. So you keep the sign that right, and then you go up. I missed that step, sorry. So the only one that would reverse is enthalpy of formation. Yes, Om? So alternatively, yeah. could you just do um, the absolute value and then the, the direction of the arrow from the sign? <sighs> that is true, but the problem is what I worry about is if you get the sign wrong in your equation, the absolute value won't matter because your quantity will be wrong. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, if your like if your sign of delta HF is wrong, or yeah, then your number's gonna be wrong no matter what. So you might you could you could understand it and still not get the right value. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, the endothermic with sulfur, it turns out um, that while reaching the octet is a more stable process the extra repulsion of sulfur when it has like one additional electron already to force it to gain the second electron actually requires energy into the structure so there's extra repulsion there when it's s minus one um to go to s minus two and so that extra repulsion actually makes it harder to gain an, an additional electron um for that reaction. But I don't think you'll have to explain that. But yeah, this could work no matter what you're solving for. This is what I like about it because this will work for no matter what you're solving for here. You know, you could literally say, I want to solve for this value here from this product reactants to this products. And I would just do this and change every single arrow I need to do, right? 
and you would always get the right arrows and you would always get it um, the correct way. And so you've got to remember here, like Erica said, that this is going upward and this is going downward here. So you need to flip this one, 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 um, keep this one, keep this one in the right direction here in this case here. So yeah, make sure that you're reading the arrow correctly here. So I think that simplifies energy cycles a lot more than trying to memorize like, because I mean, the IB could just come up with a random energy cycle that you've never seen before using enthalpy formations or enthalpy combustions, and it would still apply. That's why I don't like memorizing. Well, enthalpy of solution is enthalpy, last enthalpy plus enthalpy of hydrations, because they'll just give you a different energy cycle. And then what do you do then? Under, do a general idea and then you're good. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Um, For um, this question is where you have to find the combined enthalpy and the combustion and enthalpy and stuff like that. To figure out whether it's reacting to my products, you look at like what side the desired species is on. Yeah. Yeah, you write out one combustion reaction or you write out one formation reaction and whatever the desired side is on, that tells you right away which, which way it should be. Yeah. Okay. Organic. I know no one loves organic, but I think one of the big things they like to do is complete the pathway. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have the nitra nitration nitrating agent reaction in here because I the IV actually did ask for it one of these years and so but I think you could figure it out if you needed to but we can talk about that later okay you know like how you make NO2 plus like you combine sulfuric acid and nitric acid to form the nucleophile one year they actually asked you that reaction like where it makes NO2 plus plus HSO4 minus plus or like H2SO4 or HSO4 minus like plus water and stuff like that so like we will go over that a little bit later okay completing the pathway this is something i saw on an old exam because i think um understanding these ideas sl and hl is super important to know um what you're doing and how you're going to get there and so i'll do it on the sl level here let's say we have Butene, okay. Butene is C four H ten. Okay. Now, we can convert butene into two chlorobutane. C4, oh, sorry, C4H8, sorry. I looked at that, C4H9Cl. Maybe they don't even tell you it's two chlorobutane, they expect you to know it. Okay, they just tell you C4H9Cl, okay? Let's say you add the reagent NaOH to two chlorobutane. And then you add an oxidizing agent to that product. Okay. Okay. This is a lot of pathway stuff. This is a lot of you figure out applying those organic chemistry reactions. If your HL what you can probably guess is they're going to have you draw the mechanism of the two chlorobutane to that species because what is that species that's produced when you react a halogen alkane with a sodium hydroxide an alcohol specifically what alcohol it's a secondary. secondary and if you were to name it what would it be it'd be uh, uh yeah two butanol or butan two all so this is butane 2 all 
because the chlorine's on the second carbon, so the hydroxyl should be on the same carbon. So butane two all. Right. So that's a good question. For HL, they would probably accept either one Moritz in this case, or they might specify. They might say, or they might say, the pro this process can undergo. Um, SN1 or SN2, draw, outline the mechanism of one of those processes, and they would take either one, the carbocation or the intermediate, doesn't matter. That's HL, SL, don't freak out, okay? <laughs> now, once you convert butane to all, when you expose that to an oxidizing agent, what do you expect the product to be of that butane to all? Ketone. ketone. Specifically, what ketone? Two, uh, butane 2 oh. Butane 2 ohm. exactly. C four H eight O. So understanding that process, and so you might ask, like, what is what for SL or HL? What's the process that is A for this? What is the reaction that's occurring for A? What would, what type of reaction is occurring? Sorry. Nucleophilic substitution. Because you're substituting the Cl for the OH. Okay. Yes. Yes, all addition reactions, really. Yeah. I don't think you have to say electrophilic. I think they'll accept addition. Okay. I'm trying to think of what SL, other things SL I could say here. Okay. Oh, let's look at this. Let's call this I and 2I. Okay. Compare the boiling points of I versus 2I for II in this pathway, okay? So I'm trying to see if there are any different <laughs> Anyone want to take a shot at it in the Zoom call? Compare the boiling points of butane 2 all versus butane 2 own. Okay, Lara. So the boiling point for butane 2 all would be there with the hydrogen. Okay, and where's butane 2 own have? Double bond. Uh, um, IMF wise. Um, no, that's bonding. IMFs. What are the three IMFs that we choose from? Oh, London. Uh, it has dipole. Dipole, exactly. So Lara hit it right on the head, but we have to make sure we are kind of more, uh, um, more detail there. So this one has the greater boiling point because it has hydrogen bonding, IMF versus this, which has dipole dipole, which is weaker, which means it takes less energy to break those IMFs. So remember, whatever you're comparing, you need to address both species. You want to maximize points, you have to compare both species to each other. So butane 2 all would have the higher boiling point. Yes, Maritz? You could distill it if you wanted to, yes. Yeah, I would say that really when you're talking about this, you're just talking about the strongest um, because the molar masses are relatively the same. So London dispersion forces don't really come into account when you have other IMS. That's a good question. You dipole dipole is fine. Okay. Let's spin this to higher level a little bit. Okay. And then we'll take a break because it's 856 already. Okay. Two chlorobutane. Okay. Draw out two chlorobutane. Does two chlorobutane have a chiral carbon? Does two two yes. chlor? Oh, yes, yes. oh, 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 what is it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, where is it? The second one. The one you drew specifically. Hush, Alejandro. <laughs> okay, there's your chiral carbon. Okay. And so 
that chiral carbon creates optical isomers, two optical isomers, two in fact, because every op chiral carbon creates a power of two isomers. So if you have two chiral carbons, that's four isomers. If it's three chiral carbons, it's eight isomers. So you, it's exponent, not just multiplied by two. Because remember, you, have, you add more and more combinations every time, right? Because if you flip a coin three times, you have eight possibilities. <laughs> Took you a little while to think about that. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, so you have to combine. You have to do all the combinations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then nucleophilic substitution, SN1 or SN2 reaction here. Okay. Yes. So just a quick question. If you have um, black carbon, right? And mm -hmm. It has to be immediate. Okay, so it can't be the branches. Correct. If anything has two H's on it, not an optical isomer. That's a rule of thumb. Okay. So I would predict if they're going to talk about organic chemistry, this is what they're going to be talking about, a pathway. And HL top question will be longer than SL topic because there's more things to ask about. Like I saw the question on HL test where you have instead propene, which is C3H6 produces C3H7Cl, produces C3H8O, produces C3H6O, okay. So what is that step between the, the halogen and the... Well, C, C3H8O, they wrote it that way on purpose. How do you get this? So okay. Like, is it, are they like skipping a step? Though? No, they're, that, that is a step. So here's the thing. They wrote it this way on purpose, the way they should really write it. Oh. Yeah, see, they're doing that on purpose to see if you can actually see that, right? And so that's what they really mean by that, and they're trying to catch you. Okay, let me ask you this, HL. Why can't SL do this properly? Why can't SL? Shut up. <laughs> I'd pit some of these SL kids against you any day, oh. Okay. Why can't SL do this reaction? Because they don't know what double bonds are. No, shush. <laughs> Look at this. Draw propene out. Draw propene out. Is it like Markovnikov? I don't know. We'll see. Draw it out. Oh, yeah. Maybe you're just mad. What about propene makes it different than butyrene? What's the term? Anyone in Zoom call as well? What's the term for propene versus butyrene? Yeah. Lack of symmetry. Lack of symmetry. Asymmetrical. This is an asymmetrical alkene. So, like y'all said, it makes two different products. So you can actually make two different C3H7Cls. Whereas SL, you only do symmetrical, so you always have one predictable product in this process. That's the difference here, because now you can make two different products here, which means you can make two different products at C3HO, which means you can make different products at C3H6O as well. So that's really kind of crazy here, and I'm going to pause here for a five-minute break, and then we'll resume doing that HL question um, after the break at 9.05. Revisiting this, okay, for HL, okay, because propene, like we said, is, bless you, is an asymmetrical alkene. So according to Markovnikov's rule, you have two different products that you can produce here, okay? What are those two different products? Yeah, Maritz. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, either way, yeah. One chloropropane, two chloropropane. So it could be um, this or this. Okay. Two chloropropane or one chloropropane. And then those both undergo nucleophilic substitution to produce. Propen 2 all 
and propen-1-ol. And those can both oxidize to C3H6O, which is propanone, or propanal. So you've got to know all those different pathways, especially for higher level to understand that and identify which one's a major product and a minor product, right? You have to remember that <clears throat> the major product is the one where the H adds to the carbon with the more H's already. And then the halogen adds to the carbon. Essentially, you want to make the highest degree possible. The major product's always going to be the higher degree. Yes, Alejandro. Wait, what? What? Oxidize, you mean? It could, but in this problem, they stopped here. Oh, okay, okay. So you would, it would, you, yeah, but you're right. You could take the propanol and oxidize it one more time and make it propanoic acid. You're correct. And unless we ask for like both the major and minor products, if you just say it's the major product, you go along with it, they don't feel like they're not specific or what? That's a good question. Um, they will generally specify this. I think on this exam, they said like later on the question like i think on the first question they said one of the possible <clears throat> one of the possible products of the first reaction is two chloropropane yeah. okay draw out two chloropropane and then state like the products on that and then later on it said state and explain why propanal might be a minor product in this whole pathway so you have to explain well you could make one chloropropane from the addition reaction which then Turns into propanol, <clears throat> propan one all, and then turns into propanol. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, questions about that? For oh yeah. Oh, because major is defined when the H bonds to um, the carbon with the already the most hydrogens. Because you want to make the carbocation that has the highest degree of carbon. So making this the positive versus making this the positive is more stable. So then the CL can attack that and that's why that one's the major one. Okay, okay back to SL and HL alike, okay? Polymers, we've seen quite a few questions on this and people have asked me about multiple choice and stuff like that. And I mentioned this a little bit yesterday, but again, the, uh, the only type of polymers you're going to be dealing with are addition polymers. They've removed condensation polymers from this section. So the only type of polymer you'll have is an addition. And so if you have something like this, this is your repeating unit in the polymer. And all you do to get the monomer is remove this and remove this and add this. So really all you're doing is replacing that bond in the middle with a double bond because that's what it originated. Okay, so the monomer is that. Now, if they ask you to draw three repeating units then you should have six carbons extended here. And you should have the repetition of that CH3. Oh, sorry. In the top part of the section. Never is there ever a carbon that's not involved in the double bond as part of the main chain of a polymer. Never. There's never a CH3 that gets grouped in there. It's always branched off of the main chain. The only carbons that can ever form part of the main chain in a polymer are the ones that are double bonded. That's it. Okay. Questions about that? Sorry, this is three repeating units. That's usually what they have you draw for a polymer if they ask you to draw. Yes. If they ask for the three repeating units, um, we still have to put it in the brackets, right? Yes. You oh, still okay. have to put it in parentheses with the end of the subscript. Yes, Sarah, you're right. 
So you have to put the parentheses and the N, even if you draw three repeating units. That is part of the polymer notation. Yes. Okay. Skeletal formulas. This is SL and HL alike. They don't require you to draw skeletal formulas. In fact, I don't think they want you to, but for some reason, the IB uses them a lot. And I think a lot of students overlook and forget what that skeletal formula means. And one of the things that common mistakes, I think, is they forget about H's. Because H's are not explicitly drawn unless it's necessary for the structure itself. And so what you'll look at is something like this. And they'll ask you, like, how many single bonds and how many double bonds are present? And whether SL or HL, you forget that there's an H here, there's an H here, there's an H here, there's an H here, and there's an H here. So you actually have more bonds than you see skeletally drawn because all the H's are implied. So that's what I worry about when you look at structures, because you just start counting lines like, oh, those are all bonds, and you forget there's four H's on benzene or five H's on benzene that you don't normally, you don't have drawn out. And so for, when you're counting sigma and pi bonds for a higher level, that also factors in. So don't forget about skeletal structures. They like drawing them. And every line is an, a carbon unless otherwise stated. So this, one, two, three, four, five, six, translates into this. Yes. Okay, so if I'm counting here, um, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I guess, well, okay, sorry. <sighs> sorry, with the, the double bonds here, okay, I guess I probably shouldn't have sing, single bond double bonds because really I, I meant to say sigma and pi bonds because I would say sigma bonds and pi bonds here. So then I'd say, 11, 12, 13, 14 pi bonds, and I'm um, 14 sigma bonds and four pi bonds. That's what I would see in that structure. Yeah, that's kind of confusing with the resonance. I, I was trying to make it an SL question, and it's not really, it didn't work out exactly that way. But I guess if you're really counting this, you would count it as five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 single bonds and four double bonds, if that's really what you're talking about here. Um, yes, Alejandro. Yes. Correct. Yeah. What you need to understand about benzene is although we draw it with alternating double bonds and single bonds, that's not the way its structure actually is. It's delocalized double bonds around because there's experimental evidence for that as well. And they've asked about that as well because all the bond lengths on benzene are the same. If it were actually alternating double bonds and single bonds, the bond lengths would be different. It wouldn't be a regular hexagon in that case. So, yeah, you don't, while you draw benzene as alternating double bonds, the reality is it's delocalized um, double bonds all the way around it. Huh? Not unless you have the resonance. But, like, if you see the resonance, do you assume that as well? Yes. Yeah. A lot of times when they're not wanting you to count like double bonds and stuff like that, they'll put a circle in there instead of the alternating double bonds. Oh, so then you wouldn't count it as like a pi bond? No, I think you, you still count it as three pi bonds. Because there are three pi bonds, it's just those three pi bonds are delocalized around all six carbons. Okay. Yeah, I would... I think one of the hangups for organic chemistry is a lot about converting structural formulas into like the actual structures. I think there's a lot on SL and HL about 
converting structures and making sure you see what they mean. Like, for example, you might see something like, this and understanding what that structure actually translates to here is really important to getting the question right because a lot of kids again when you try to come up with these rationalizations you'll say like oh a tertiary halogen alkane always has a ch33 group on it they always say that right because um and then they don't look at the rest of it where the CL is actually not bonded to the carbon that has three CH3 groups to it, right? And so this is a primary. Whereas this is a tertiary. So don't make those rash generalizations about trying to find shortcuts and stuff like that because the IB will exploit that. They'll say, oh, we know that a lot of students just say that every time they see a CH33, they think it's tertiary. So we'll write it with an extra carbon to see if you're really paying attention and you really understand it. So again, exploiting misconceptions, rash generalizations, oversimplifications of concepts. So really make sure you know how to draw out the structure from instructional formulas for organic molecules and know what each of those function groups look like in there. You know, if you see something like CH3, CH2, CO, CH3, you have to know that this is a ketone because that carbon doesn't have enough hydrogens to be an ether, right? So that has it, that 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 um, that formula tells you that there's a carboxyl group, a car carbonyl group there instead of an ether chain across because that carbon doesn't have enough hydrogen to support it because every carbon needs to have four bonds. Yeah. Questions? Okay. Huh? Every organic molecule carbon has four bonds. Yeah, there's never a time where it would have less than four bonds or more, to be honest with you. Okay, in a completely different note, this is a kind of a calculation question for SL and HL alike. And it is called the hydrate problem. And it's kind of like empirical formula here, okay? But it's not exactly, that's what I think throws a lot of kids off, okay? A hydrate is a species that has water molecules strongly attracted to it so it's unable to be physically separated apart. So I, I like, I guess like, yeah, you can't separate the water part unless you heat it really, really high. And so you'll see something like this, where X is the number of water molecules surrounding each molecule of CuCl2. And the only way you can remove the water is to heat it up to really high temperatures to break off all those attractions. So the water vaporizes and leaves the substance. And so this is a very much like an empirical formula problem, but you need to know where you start. And so like they'll give you the value of the crucible and the hydrated copper two chloride. And then they'll give you the crucible and the dehydrated copper two chloride. And then they'll just give you the crucible. Maybe not in that order, but those values. Okay. So it might be something like 16.05 grams, 18.12 um, grams, and then 17.34 grams. Actually, you know what? Let me make this bigger. 16.44 grams. I don't know if these numbers are going to work or not, so we'll see. But the idea here is to figure out how much copper two chloride you have and then how much water you have, because those are the ratio that you're trying to find. And so here, the 18.12 minus 16.05 gets you the mass 
of the copper two chloride. And with the water, sorry, with the water. Okay. Now the difference in mass, 18.12 minus 16.44, which is one point uh five eight. Yeah. Wait, or six eight tiny. Okay. Okay, one point six eight grams is the amount of water you have. Oops, I don't even know why I think. It's the amount of water you have. So therefore, the amount of copper chloride you have is uh, 0 0.39 grams, right? Yes, Alejandro. Yes, you could. Yeah, you could. I realized that as I was doing this, that there was an easier way to do it, but that's okay. Okay. Luckily, I'm not documenting this for um, future purposes to embarrass myself. Okay. All right. So, yes, Alejandro's right. If you want to find the copper chloride itself, you could just take these two values. And luckily, you get the same answer, or that would have been really weird. Okay. So, you know that you have 1.68 grams of water and 0.39 grams of copper 2 chloride. And your job is to try to find that X because that X will always be greater than one. Like it's always one mole of copper two chloride to X number of moles of water. And so 0 0.39 grams of copper two chloride and 1.68 grams of water. I hope you're solving this silly because I don't know how it's going to turn out. Okay. 18.02 grams of water. Because empirical formula, you need to remember that the point of it is to get to moles. Because that way you can find the ratio between the two substances. Okay. Copper. Yeah, copper is 63.45 plus 70.9. So that's 134.35. Is that right? Okay. Uh, uh, mental math should never be a show off. Y'all should be able to do this stuff as well. Okay. It should be an expectation, not a an, an impressive move. Okay. What did you get for moles here? <laughs> no, no, I cannot do that in my head, Alondra. For the water, I got point one one. Okay. What'd you get for copper chloride? Are you sure you got 0.17 divided by 18.2? Why is it 2.7? It's 1.68. Oopsies. It's 0.0932. I know that. 0 0.0932. Okay. Oh, this is going to be weird. Okay. So now we divide by the smallest number. No, it's actually 40, I think. Because I think there's an extra zero, oh, right? Okay. 32. 32? Okay, so X equals 32 here. So unfortunately, my numbers were not that great, but the process is still there. 32 waters is a lot of waters, by the way. <laughs> Usually it's like four. Okay, so 32 is a significantly high amount. Maybe it's six, maybe it's two, but I don't think it's going to be above really much 10, I hope. But so again, I just made these numbers. I'm lucky that I even got a whole number, to be honest with you. Like it could have been like, 42.3. Like right? Okay. So that's hydrate. So that's kind of a typical example of a lab problem. Yes, Lily. I saw a question similar to this in one of the practice ones I did. Like it gave me like the hydrate with X and then it just like said it equal to like the like the dehydrated plus the water. And like I just thought that that was such a weird question to have. Like I, I I'm describing it poorly. And then they, they gave you the mass of like the first thing. I think they only gave you like one mass, which was weird to me. Okay, that feels weird. I feel like you have to at least have two masses. Let me see if I can find it. Okay. Because like you have to have at least the mass of the hydrate with the water and then the mass after it's dehydrated to be able to solve all of it. I don't think you can only do it with one mass. Is it bad though? Huh? 
Yeah, because if you have the dehydrated and the hydrated, yeah. then you can figure out the water was the difference. Yeah, but can you figure out the mass of the That's the dehydrated. That mass alone is the dehydrated element. Oh, yeah, no, but doesn't that also include the crucible? No, I think she was just saying they just omitted the crucible and just gave oh, you those okay, values. Okay, no. Yeah, I just thought it was, it was a multiple choice question, too, which I thought was even weirder. Like, but it was the first multiple choice question. I'm like, I think it was November 20th. Oh, but that wasn't probably like how many oxygen atoms are there in a hydrate? It was to find the coefficient. It was like the, the options were like 0, 1, 5, or 10. It was 5. It was such a weird question. Did they tell you the percent, like, by mass of water, I mean, that's what they did. I think they, I think they gave you the mass of like the whole thing. Yeah. And they might have given you one more mass, but I don't. I don't, I don't oh, oh, yeah. If they give you the mass of the whole thing and they give you the formula, then you could figure that out, right? Because if you have the mass of the hydrate, you know the mass of the copper chloride yeah. by using the periodic table. So if you find the percent by mass there, mm -hmm. you could figure out how much water is attached yeah, to it. So so oh, yeah. So you just subtract. So if you have the molar mass. Oh, let's see. Yeah, so you just turn it into small. Okay. I need to see a question, but I think I know what you're I'll, saying. I'll show you the, I'll, I'll find them. Because, like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. So if they give you the mass of the hydrate, and you know the molar mass of the, the chloride, I mean, the, the, um, the, the, the compound, then you could figure out the hydrate formula. I feel like there's, yeah, find that question. Okay. Yeah, sure. Because I think we've talked about the main lab questions that they'll ask about. Like the only thing that for HL that we haven't really talked about, which we're going to talk about now, is like rate laws and stuff like that. But for SL, you've got calorimetry, you've got empirical formula. I think that's it. I mean, like those are the main labs, empirical formula um, and calorimetry. Like, I think those are the things that they would ask you about. Yeah, can you close that, Erica? Thank you. Luthia, did you have a question? Oh, that was a thumbs up? Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> oh, really quickly for HL, um, that reaction I was telling you about with the nitration of benzene. Um, that's one of the acceptable answers that you can do to get the. Um, Wait, is that like a uh, it's it's almost. Um, yeah, because what happens is the sulfuric acid donates a hydrogen to HNO3. It makes an H2NO3 complex, and then the water breaks off, and that's how you get. Yeah, that's why it's kind of like you would argue that this is kind of the salt right here. Because, right, because there's two ions. So technically, it's HSO4, NO2, but they don't really bond together. The water dissociates them. So this is how you make the NO2 plus the nucleophile. Okay. Yeah. And then ohm. Yes. Dissociate 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Ohm. Once the reaction, so you have to memorize just like this, are all like acid base. Are you not including like the free radical, like ozone and like? Yeah, I mean, like the, the list of like six or seven reactions that's just like in the topic of three or something like that. Yes, those for Na2O, MgO, P4O10, SO3, NO2 as well in there. Yeah, they're all like those kind of reactions. Yeah. Is that you just didn't know those reactions as well? Yes. Those are specific ones. They explicitly say that you need to know those reactions with water. Really know the NO2 reaction for SL and HL, like for SL and HL, I would know this reaction because it's just one that you wouldn't be able to figure out on your own. Um, I just don't think it's intuitive enough that you'd be able to figure this out. So like, if they're gonna ask you anything about any of the reactions, it'll probably be this one. Cause like SO3 is obvious. You just combine it with the water and you make H2SO4, you know, or like Na2O reacting with water is NaOH. 
So, but this one seems to be the one with acid deposition that they really like to ask about. It forms H3PO4. And then you can balance the rest of it yourself. Okay. Yes, Lily. That's fine. Um, when I asked for like an ion reaction, I saw one that's like they didn't want, they just wanted like the cation reaction. They didn't want anything to do with any of the ions. It's like, it's something so confusing. I'm like, if it asks for an ion reaction, is everything that it's charged? Or like, I think what they mean there is they want to remove all the spectator ions, the ions that actually aren't changing. So like, um, I'm trying to think of what specific there, like, was it in redox or was it an acid base, Lily? I think it was in redox. Yeah. Yeah, they just wanted to show the ions that are oxidizing and reducing. Yeah. So you would, the CL minus, because it doesn't change, you just remove it from the equation and just write an ion form. Yeah. Um, you have one of those. Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> I would definitely look over um, this. It is something that we doc we documented in topic eight and eighteen um, at the very end, uh, where we had the bar graphs. That's this is why I did this. So we did a section of this where we were talking about the the major species that are existing in here. And so what I mean major species, I mean about 50%, like 40% or more. So while I documented here that there is some of this in here, that's not a major species. So it kind of needs to be like halfway or higher. So when you first start with the weak acid, most of it's just weak acid, it doesn't dissociate. Okay? Once you start adding base, that neutralizes some of the acid. And so therefore you make some more conjugate base. And now this is a major species. And at the point where they're the same, halfway to the equivalence point, you have the equal amount of weak acid in this conjugate, therefore the pH equals pKa. And then once you get the equivalence point, there's no more acid, and all you have left is conjugate. So that's the way you want to think about it in terms like, I would say this, okay? If you're trying to do that question, whether it's S, uh, well, I guess this is HL, I would think of it this way, okay? Um, I would think of it this way. I would say, okay, here's my weak base. I mean, sorry, weak acid plus my strong base to form this. And I want to, I want to think at every scenario, what's happening reaction wise and what's being produced and stuff like that. So at the first part, you have zero of this. So then you wouldn't have any of this in the solution yet or a significant amount. But once you start adding this, this goes down and this goes up. And so now you get more and more of this combination until you get to the point where they're half and half. And then after that, it starts going down and down until you get to the equivalence point where all this neutralized and that's all you have left. They were only gonna ask you about specific points. I don't think they're gonna ask you like at 30% of the way up the titration curve. The point A, B, and C are the main ones. Halfway to the equivalence point, equivalence point, and initial are the main ideas that they would ask you about. Okay. Um, SL, I'm going to let you a little bit early because this last like um, 13 minutes is going to be just HL on here, but um, we will revisit shapes and trends in fifth period and last minute main ideas in ninth period. So I'll see y'all then. If you if you want to hang around and ask questions after this period's over, you're more than welcome to because I'll I'll open it up for like open questions. I know Josephine has already asked to meet with me first, but then after that, I'll answer any other questions. Okay. Bye, so. Okay. So rate law. Okay, I think the challenging part about this is when you don't have something that's constant. 
that's what we were talking about before because the IB wants to make sure that you really understand how to calculate these ideas. And so you might have something like this. Okay. And the rate might be 8, 16, um, 32. Okay. Now, like I said before, you always try to find the constant and then see what happens there. And so if you're solving for A, you want B to be constant. So you could look at A and say, well, A is doubled and rate is doubled. So A is first order because essentially what you're saying is two to the X equals two because the concentration doubled and the rate doubled. And so what power is the rate being affected? Power is one. The problem with B is there's no place where A is constant. So if you're going to take B and change it, you have to factor in A's change before you factor in B. So let's say we use trial two and three. Well, A doubles, B doubles, and the rate doubles. So if the rate doubles, we already know that A has a direct effect on it. So if A doubles and rate doubles, then B's doubling really has no effect on it because A's doubling already has doubled the rate. So B's order is actually zero. Now there's an easier way to do this or less kind of complex, like a more visual way to do it. What I do is this, and this is a foolproof way to figure out rate loss. So if you don't like writing doubles and quadruples in your problem and you want to do a consistent way to do every single rate law problem, this is the way to do it. What you want to do is pick two experiments and put them over each other. And when you're doing this, you want to try to make one of them constant. So that way it cancels out. So you're left with only one thing that's a variable. And so K is always going to cancel out because K is constant. And so you'll get a rate ratio and then you'll get a molarity ratio for each of these situations. So for example, for A, when I use trial one and two, rate is eight over 16. A is one to the M, two to the M, and B is two to the, sorry, two to the N and two to the N. So that cancels out. So this is one half is equal to one half to the M. So M equals one. Yes, Alejandro. We don't know that yet though. I'm, I'm trying to do, I'm starting from scratch again. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm starting from A again, assuming we didn't know what B is. So now we know that, now we know A is one, we can plug that in. And so we could do rate two over rate three to solve for B, because B is changing and A is changing as well, but we can factor that in. So it's 16 over 32 is equal to two to the one over four to the one times two to the N over four to the N. So this is one half is equal to one half times one half to the N. We divide over and N must equal zero here. So if you want a foolproof way to do rate law, even if there, even if there are constants in both um, reactants, this is a foolproof way to do it. It will always work. And if you really want to make it easier on yourselves, make the higher rate on top. That way you get whole numbers instead of fractions, but the fractions usually work out pretty nicely. But if you wanna just do whole numbers, make sure the higher rate is on top so you get numbers larger than one, so it's easier to see. I think sometimes three to nine is easier to see than one third to one ninth or something like that. So um, that's the idea here. So I find that this way is the kind of foolproof way for higher level um, to determine rate law if there's not one that's constant. And if I'm the IB, that's the way I would wanna do it to make it more challenging for students and really understand. Now, some of y'all 
may be fine with a, oh, I understand if I double, double, and then double, that I just divide the A effect away from it and then see what's left. If you understand that, that's fine. But if you want a consistent way to do it, it's this way. Erica. Oh, yeah. So essentially what I did here was I said A to the one, Y to the second. And the rate change was two. So that double is already because of A. So therefore B has no effect, which is saying essentially the same thing as this. It's just written in a different way. Yeah, just make sure you understand why you're doing that and stuff like that. Okay. Alejandro. Yes, sure. Solving for K units. Okay, once you find... Actually, I think we'll, we'll stick with the same problem. A is the first power, B is the zero power. The rate is generally moles per decimeter cubed per unit time. Let's say it's seconds here. They'll usually give the units in the table as well, like molarity per second and stuff like that. K's purpose is to make the units match on both sides. So your job is, okay, what's the, molar, what's the unit of A? Well, it's just molarities per decimeter. And B is zero power, so there's no unit there at all. So for this to fill in to make it sense, the unit would just be one over S seconds for K, or seconds to the negative one. Because that's how you multiply those values together and get the right unit. Now, if this were squared, now you squared molarity, so you have to get rid of one of those molarities to make the units equal, right? So then now this becomes decimeters cubed over moles that you can cancel out one of the molarities. So then it becomes decimeters cubed moles to the negative one, seconds to the negative one. Questions about that? That is a good question. Understanding the units of K, because if you're going to do a rate law question, guaranteed part of it will be determine K and determine the units of K. Guaranteed. If there's a rate law question on the test. Yeah, can you repeat when you square A? If, if A is squared, then the units of it are squared, so then the molarity is squared as well. But the, mo the unit of rate is just one molarity, so you'd have to cancel out one of those molarities on the right side so that it, you only are left with one molarity. So like when, when this happens, Luthia, that's really mole squared over decimeters to the sixth. But you want decimeters cubed and you want, decim you want moles to the first. So K has to have decimeters cubed on top and moles on the bottom to cancel that out. And then time as well. Time should always be on the bottom. I have one more thing that um, I want to talk about because a lot of students that I've individually met with me have asked about this. And so, um, and that's reaction mechanisms, rate mechanisms, slow steps and things like that. It's been a while since y'all have had to visit some of that. Okay. Sorry, Luthia, you got it? Yeah. Okay. So slow steps, fast steps and galore. Okay, the slow step for higher level, their coefficients, equal the exponents. The overall reaction doesn't, but the slow step coefficients always equal the exponents in the rate law. So if you have something like A plus A yields B, and then B plus C yields D, and this is the slow step and this is the fast step, then the rate law of this is equal to K times A squared. Oh, sorry, that's plus C. I missed that. Now, if you reverse the slow and fast steps, the rate law becomes different because B, what do we call B? Intermediate. Because intermediates can't be in rate laws. So what do you have to do that intermediate? Replace it with what, Maritz? 
with the reactants, 2A. So therefore, in this case, the rate law is equal to A squared times C. So you're probably not going to have to suggest reaction mechanisms, but the IB could have you solve a whole problem and go, a student suggested this reaction mechanism. State and explain whether that student is correct based on your information. So you'd have to compare your rate law versus their mechanism. And does the mechanism add up? And does their slow step rep reflect your exponents? If it doesn't, then you say, no, it's incorrect because I had A squared and this reaction slow step only has one A. Yes, Om? So you determine both, or you just based on the rate, and not everything cancels out to make the rate slow? Yes, yes. Because you're right. They're like, if the IB asks you to suggest a mechanism, a lot of people would get different mechanisms for their answer. But as long as, like you said, they add up and the slow step reflects the exponent, that's all that matters. If you ever get, if you ever get a total order that more than two, because remember, collision theory says only two particles can collide at once. If you get an order of more than two, you're going to have to have a fast step and then a slow step. There's no reason to have a slow step for the first step. Uh, because that would that'd be too many particles colliding. But So you'd have to do some substitution there and have an intermediate. Okay. Yes, Laura. If you wrote down, like to the rate of the bottom one, if you wrote it as KBC, does that mean wrong? Yes. Yeah, you can't write B. The, if it's fast, slow, fast, the last fast doesn't matter. Yeah. Only fast steps before the slow it step. Does for like the overall yes, it does matter for the overall equation, right, Moritz? Okay. That is a good starting point. I'm like I said, if I have time, I'm gonna work on making a list of hard IB questions that you may want to go look back at um, that made me kind of take a second glance at them. Um, and I'll send that out in an email later today. So for those of you studying tonight. Okay. All right. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trump.